Welcome to the care and feeding of your Hasselblad 500CM film camera. Medium format. These are amazing cameras. They can be had for pretty cheaply now because uh, people went to digital. And though Hasselblad makes digital medium format cameras, they're not very affordable. They're like $20,000 or more. And so we have a whole bunch of these cameras from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s that are still totally functional and still take fantastic pictures and are of the highest quality that were really ever made. And so you can still buy film, 120 or 220. You can get 20, 220 expired film on eBay. You can buy all sorts of 120 film, brand new still. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you basically um, what the deal is with this. And um, I have a 500 cm that's black, and I wouldn't recommend getting anything older than a 500 cm. Don't get a 500 c, for example, because the viewfinder, the ground glass, is not interchangeable, and it's pretty dim, and it's older technology, and it's just a lot better now. So basically, um, the straps come on and off easily. Um, here's the bubble level. It's optional. Just a little thing to help you level it. The straps come off really easy. I'm going to do that for the sake of this. It's a modular camera. means it's got lots of different parts. Different types of cranks are available. Different kinds of backs are available. And of course, different kinds of lenses and lens accessories are available, such as the focus lever. And it just comes apart like that. And then this slides off. And the, uh, the 500CM has these little adjustable tabs in here that you can see. Uh, let me grab a pointer. I'm going to grab a pencil here. It has these little tabs in here like this. And you push those out of the way. And whatever version of ground glass that you have in there just drops right in. So you have the camera. It's just a box. Just a box. That's all it is. It's a fancy box. All metal. No batteries. Um, there's no menus. There's. It's just gears. It's purely mechanical. It's fixable. I've taken this one apart and fixed it. That's not necessarily for everyone. But if you're mechanically oriented, you're going to be able to fix this probably much easier than your digital camera, for example. Um, it all just, you know, the ha the different. There's different cranks and stuff. They go on really easily. They're nice quality, you know. The thing about Hasselblad stuff is it's it's pretty expensive, um, but you can get good deals. I, I buy on eBay, and I but but oftentimes I like to buy from keh.com because it comes with a warranty and a uh, a six month warranty and a two week trial period, no risk. Um, you can return it for whatever reason, and that's really good. Because old gear, you know, you might not like it, it might be in too rough a shape, but their bargain grade is very conservative, and um, I just, most of the stuff I have is bargain grade, and you can tell that, like, it's it's fine. It's just totally fine, um, and much better price. But basically, you have, um, you have the shooting button, and then the rear film curtain, and you have the winder. This is a lock. Right here, that once you push this in, keeps it in, mirrors up. That stays open for long exposures or for timer exposures. And to re trigger it, you just push it back this way. Um, what else? Here's a mirror up button that makes the, the mirror stay up. And then you can shoot the, the picture. Um, that'll keep it from slapping around and vibrating. Let's see, I forgot how you get rid of that. Oh, you gotta press the button. Out of and you know that's the body. It's got a tripod socket. The cool thing about these cameras is they're totally interkeyed mechanically, which means if the dark slide is in, it won't fire, and if the dark slide is out, the back won't come off. So they've really thought about that long ago and kept it from uh, kept you from ruining the film. Um, this is a 120 back. I'm going to show you how to load that. Uh, I have these slide keepers on the back, which is cool. This comes off. There's no film in this. And then it just tucks in there, which is really handy. Um, I'm going to put this back. The slides have a 
they have a way that they sit. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but this thing curls up this way. So if you put it in with the curl pointing towards the front of the camera, you'll be able to pull this off, no problem. If it's reversed, even if this is folded the other way, it'll pull the slide with it. So I put it so that it doesn't pull the slide with it, just for convenience. So you pull that out. Here's the here's the film insert. You lift that out, pull this over. This one tips up. That's the uptake. Turn it so it's locked. Now it's keyed in. Put the slot so it's facing sort of towards the roller. Get a roll of film. Open it up. Pull off the the keeper tape. Unexposed, it says. And when you put it on, you got to put it on. Put it on the spool that has the little red, the little red marker on it. And you put it so that it kind of folds off backwards. Before you pull it across, loosen that so that it lifts up this little tab so that the film can go under there. Notice if I re if I return this, it's locked in. I'll tell you why it does that later. Pull that out like that. Take the tab, feed it in. It takes a little bit of skillful handwork to get this all lined up so that it's it's all okay. Be sure that it's sort of tucked in tight because that crease there holds it on the spool. And you wind it out. I sort of hold it kind of tightish so there's no slack. The arrows show up pretty soon on a 120 roll. On a 220 roll, it takes a while, but it lines up with a little carrot there. And then before you put it in the camera, just turn this back so that it grabs that leader. What I think that's for is so that if you're putting it in, you don't grab your edge of the film paper and rip it, etc. So then you put it in, all the way in until it clicks. Turn it back, fold it in. Now it's all in, it's locked in. Then you grab the handle. In the window here, it'll say zero, and there's no color in this smaller one. There's either going to be a red or a white or nothing. Right now it's nothing, that means nothing's loaded. So you turn it around until it stops. Now it says one, and now it's white. If I were to put this on and shoot a picture, that white would go red, which means it needs to be wound. So you'd have to wind it on the body. So that's in. So the slide, you know, leave it in because there's live film in there now. That's that. <clears throat> Two, this is a 120 back. Here's a 220 back. Same thing. It behaves all the same except the counter goes up to 24 instead of 12. So now I'm going to put the the ground glass in here. You can get a variety of these. They come in many different um, versions with a grid, with a split image. Um, the, uh, there's, there's, many, the, there's many people that, you know, many versions of this are made by different people. Hasselblad, you know, makes the nice ones, I think, but there might be other really nice ones. This is called an acute matte D split image with grid. If you were to go buy this new right now, it would be about $250. And you think, well, it's just a little thing. True, but I have no idea how they make them. So you drop it in. Then you take your finder, whatever finder you want. This is a fold-up one. I'm going to do that in a second. Here's a, here's a prismatic one that has 45 degrees. That corrects the image so it's no longer backwards. Um, you can't view it down. You have to hold this up to your eye. But if you have it on a tripod and it's high up, this is pretty handy. Here's a chimney one that just goes straight up with a little eye cup thing. These these are all a varying price. You can get one of these for fifty dollars. Depends on the quality. There's also metered ones, ones that have um, light meters inside of these. This is a non-metered prism. Um, these are really nice. I think I got this for forty or fifty dollars. And this one I probably got for thirty or forty dollars. These are not in great condition, but they're absolutely functional. So you can see all the paint loss. If you wanted a perfect, nice new one, you you might pay $75 or $100. I don't know. It depends who and where you get it. But this is the typical waist level finder, the latest version. That means the newest version. There's older versions of this that work fine, but they sometimes have problems. And so um, I like this version uh, more. I like it uh, for various reasons, and I'll show you. This um, Sometimes I have to sort of pinch these innards back up so they're below this plane so that it fits on here. When you fit it on here, 
it'll hit these tiny little metal bumps and it'll cause those clips to shove back out and grab the screen. So that goes in like that. Then the back goes on. Actually, I'm going to put an empty back on so that I can fire it. That. This looks like it has, it's white, but there's no number in here. So I'm guessing that this is empty. Yeah, it's empty. Um, I'm going to put this on here. And <clears throat> this one goes like this. Notice it, this pinches in and it folds down. It's a very nicely made contraption. This folds up and then as you move your thumb thing in here and that flips up the, the close, um, the fine focus. This is a fine focus screen so that you can hold it up to your eye and get it really adjusted for where your subject is and then you fold it down here and then you can shoot from the waist which is really fun. Um, that closes down like this. Here's the lens. The lens is pretty amazing. Uh, you can get good versions of this. This is the old, sort of one of the oldest. This is a T-star. This is a coded element. Um, the, there's a C and a CT and a CFI and a CM or I forget what the other lenses are. The newer they are, the more and more expensive they got. This is a 150mm Carl Zeiss T-Star Sonar 1 to F4. Um, this I got for 160 or $175 or something like that. And then I have a filter and a focus ring. So basically this is worth about 200 bucks. You can add on, you know, sometimes they come with the hoods and stuff, and sometimes they come with rear caps. Um, the hood, you know, don't be surprised if you have to pay $30 or $40 for the hood. There's plastic versions, but this is a metal version. So if you can get one of these for $200, especially if it has a warranty, you're in good shape. Um, the lenses work on an, an exposure value system. There's shutter speeds and apertures, but this red scale over here, notice... Um, this is the EV scale. And so if you get a meter like the Gaussian Digiflash or Digi6, there's other meters that read an exposure value as their primary read. You hit the button like that and it meters the light in here. It says EV is 10. You can figure that out up here, put it up to 10, and then you can see all your combinations. But on the Hasselblad lenses, you just set it for 10. That's the exposure value for 10 at this film speed that I put in here, which is whatever I have in here, etc. What it does is it marries your aperture and shutter ring. So these are all connected now. You, you, you don't set them independently. Now they're just married this way. So if you like one second in F32, that's great. But if you like a 60th at F4, that's great. Or anything in between. Notice as it's moving, the red scale moves. So if you're focused at 30 feet and you're shooting at F32, that means that stuff from 18 feet out to 100 and plus feet is going to all be in focus. And that's called the hyperfocal uh, distance scale or something like that, depth of field scale. Um, hyperfocus is something else. Uh, what else? Here's a aperture preview button. Here's a self timer, etc. These are nice lenses. <clears throat> they have to be cocked. Either the lens has to be cocked and the body cocked, or the lens uncocked and the body not cocked. But I think the best way to load it on, I think I remember reading, is they both need to be cocked. Because this little screwdriver tip shaped thing here needs to marry with this one and the body. And if they're not lined up, it's not pretty. So you put it on and it clicks real easy. If they weren't lined up like that, that wouldn't work. And if you forced it, I think you could possibly break a mechanism that would cost you a bit to have it fixed. So, the lens is on, the back's on, the crank is on, you open it up, you find, you find focus to whatever it is, you compose, and then you shoot. It won't shoot because the dark side's in, so I'm going to pull that out. You shoot, release, there it is. This folds out on this version, they're not all like this, sometimes they're just a wheel. They make a wheel with a light meter in it too, which works pretty well. And you just wind it like that, and you can fold that back in. and close it down. What else do I need to say about this? Um, there's different attachments such as the bubble level. This comes off and here's another here's another contraption that goes on here. This is a, a different kind of um, lens shade. Um, seems it looks like it's a little bit broken. 
Anyhow, it works. Works well enough. You can get these for pretty cheap. But that's a really nice, really nice sunshade if you're working with some particular light. Um, those are neat. And what else? Lens cap. You know, a lot of the Hasselblad lenses work on the, the bayonet system. This is called a B50. There's B60, B70, B80, B90. You know, bigger and bigger the lenses go. Um, so that they're not the same. They're not really like pinch caps. You probably could put a pinch cap on there, but you'd have to measure it exactly, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of times I just don't really use the pinch cap. On this lens, I can pull the shade off and sort of put it on backwards and it fits in a bag much easier. I swing this up. There you have it. Um, what else is there to say? I send my film to this place called Duane's Photo in Parsons, Kansas. And they will scan a 120 or they'll develop and scan a 120 or 220 roll of film onto CD for a total of $8 and that includes shipping. That's a pretty good deal. They're not super high risk scans. Sometimes the, the scans have a little bit of dust on them, but I fix that usually in Adobe Lightroom 5. And all in all, if you're trying to do this on the cheap and fun, you can buy plenty of expired film on eBay. Sometimes the expired film goes for $10 a roll, especially if it's 220 because it's so rare, but sometimes you can get it for $2 a roll. I generally don't pay more than 4 and $5 a roll. Um, if you're looking for total professional output, use 120 film send it to a place like uh, North Coast Photo Services, ncps.com, down in California. It's going to cost you $20 a roll sort of thing after you get some high resolution scans, but if you're looking for professional output and um, sort of consistent quality, maybe a more professional lab is better than Duane's, but Duane's in terms of people looking just to keep it on the cheap and the fun is an absolutely stellar deal. I really have had very little problems with them. Not that I haven't had any problems with them, but I've had um, mostly like 92% good luck. And that keeps me going back because I like to have this as a, as a fun hobby. And if I want, you know, professional output for certain things, I'll use my Nikon D800, which is the camera that's filming this. And if you have any questions, go ahead and shoot me a message. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, anything else? Quick look at this. You can put a cable in here. What else? Um, this is what the different screen, the different things look like on here. You have covers. You can see there's lots of mirrors in here. This goes right on here like this. Now you would view through like this. Um, I think that's about it. If you have questions, you can send a message. Have fun out there. Bye bye.